Section 3.1, Examining Relationships. Starting out with some definitions, a response variable. It's simply the measure of an outcome of a study. In science classes, this will sometimes be called the dependent variable. Explanatory variable is the variable that helps explain or influences a change in the response variable. And again, in science classes, that may be called the independent variable. In stats, we will use the terms response variable and explanatory variable. Looking at a couple of examples here and then identifying the response variable compared to the explanatory variable. If I take the statement, the amount of hours spent in the sun and the severity of a sunburn, and we wanted to identify which is the explanatory variable and which is the response variable. In this case, the explanatory variable would be the number of hours spent in the sun. And our uh, response variable would be the severity of the sunburn. Example B, the amount of time spent in extracurricular activities and the GPA of students, explanatory variable, would be the amount of time spent in extracurricular activities. And our response variable is the GPA of the students. So in the first case, we would expect or we would be attempting to explain by the number of hours spent in the sun, the severity of the sunburn a person would receive. In the second case, our variable, which is the amount of time spent in extracurricular activities, we are attempting to use that to explain what the GPA of students would be, how that may affect it one way or another. Example 3.2 here. A study observes a large number of people over a 10 year period. The goal is to see if overweight and obese people are more likely to die during the decade than people who weigh less. Such studies can be misleading because obese people are more likely to be inactive and to be poor. What are the explanatory and response variables in the study? What other variables are mentioned that may influence the relationship between the explanatory and the response variable? Our explanatory variable here. It's the one that is attempting to explain what we are measuring, which is the likelihood of the person dying. Our explanatory variable here would be the weight of the person. Our response variable, what we are actually measuring is whether or not that they are more likely to die. So the mortality rate. The second question asks what other variables are mentioned, okay, that may influence this relationship. And this is your first introduction to what is called a lurking variable. A lurking variable is another variable that is unaccounted for, in this case, in an observational study that may also be affecting, in this case, the response variable, which is mortality rate. Other lurking variables that are mentioned here are level of activity of the person and the wealth of the person. The person with more money tend to be able to afford more preventative health care. Therefore, they may be living longer because they have the means to purchase or 
to use uh, more health care than what other people would be able to. Problem four, one of the most common treatment for breast cancer was removal of the breast. It is now usual to remove only the tumor and nearby lymph nodes followed by radiation. The change in policy was due to a large medical experiment that compared the two treatments. Some breast cancer patients chosen at random were given one or the other treatment. The patients were closely followed to see how long they lived following the surgery. What are the explanatory and response variables? Are they categorical or quantitative? Explanatory variable. Our explanatory variable is the type of treatment that they would receive. Our response variable, what we are measuring is their longevity of life. So there's our two variables. We're also asked, are these variables categorical or quantitative? Is the type of treatment they receive a categorical or quantitative variable? It is categorical because they're gonna fall into one of two categories. Either they are going to receive a treatment in which uh, only the tumor and lymph nodes are removed, followed by radiation, or they are going to have their entire breast removed. The response variable, the longevity of life, that now is a quantitative variable because we would be measuring that in years. Scatter plots and correlation. A scatter plot shows the relationship between two quantitative variables, and that is very important. We can only use a scatter plot when we are talking about quantitative variables measured on the same individuals. The values of one variable appear on the horizontal axis, the values of the other variable appear on the vertical axis. Each individual in the data appears as a point in the plot fixed by the values of both variables for that individual. Here are some tips for drawing a scatter plot by hand. Plot the explanatory variable if there is one on the horizontal axis or the x-axis of the scatter plot. As a reminder, we usually call the explanatory variable x the response variable y. If there is no explanatory or response dis distinction, either variable can go on either axis. Okay, so only if there is clearly an explanatory variable, clearly a response variable, does this matter? The rest is really just doing the same thing that we do with all graphs, make sure both axes are labeled, scale the horizontal and vertical axes, uh, the intervals must be uniform, that is the distance between the tick marks must be the same, so you cannot have breaks in the middle of your scale. If you are given a grid, try to adopt the scale so that your plot uses the whole grid. Again, we've talked about that. If you're given a grid, fill up the entire thing as best you can with your graph. In any graph of data, look for the overall pattern and striking deviations from that pattern. Okay, so overall pattern, striking deviations, this gets back into talking about your SOX acronym, shape, outlier, center, and spread. You can describe the overall pattern of a scatter plot by talking about the direction, form, and strength of the relationship. One, two, three things, and every time you talk or you describe the pattern of a scatter plot, talk about all three every time. An important kind of deviation is an outlier, an individual value that falls outside the overall pattern of the relationship. So again, talking about outliers, just as we did when we talk about a normal a distribution using our SOX acronym, we identified outliers as well. The direction. The direction of a scatter plot is simply whether there is positive association or negative association. So you will pick out one of those two things every time. The form. 
form is the shape of the relationship. Is it linear? Is it quadratic? How do you best describe the relationship of the two variables that you see graphed by your scatter plot? And the strength, how strong is the form? Is it somewhat linear? Is it a very strong linear relationship? Is it a weak linear relationship? How strong is the form? For the most part, what we're going to focus in on this class is linear relationships only. You are going to see some other relationships that are clearly curved. When we do that, we're not going to go do a, a regression based on a quadratic or an exponential or anything. We're just going to say that it's not a linear relationship. We are going to be focused only on linear relationships in this class. Positive and negative association. Okay, first of all, the positive and negative have nothing to do with whether it is a good relationship or a bad relationship. Okay, positive in this case means simply that when above average values of one variable accompany above average values of the other and below average values of one uh, is with below average of the other. Negative association is when above average values of one tend to accompany below average values of the other and vice versa. Okay, so when we're talking about positive association, basically what we're talking about is as one variable is increasing, the other one is increasing. An example of something that would have positive association, the height of a person and the weight of a person. In general, People, as they get taller, what happens? They increase in weight. An example of a negative association. First of all, negative association is as one variable increases, the other decreases. An example of this, the number of cigarettes a person smokes and the life expectancy of that person. The more cigarettes that a person smokes, the more likely they are to die at an earlier age. So their life expectancy is decreasing as the number of cigarettes increases. That is an example of a negative association. To add a categorical variable to a scatter plot, use a different plotting color or symbol for each category. And we're going to be talking about this when we look at one on the graphing calculator here coming up. Okay, but we can clearly see here the mean SAT scores and the percent of high school seniors who uh, took the test. Southern states are highlighted here in different colors. So everything here in blue is a southern state. The one in, if that's purple or whatever color that is, are all of the other uh, 50 states. Looking at example 3.6. One of the nature's patterns connects the percent of adult birds in a colony that return from the previous year and the number of new adults that join the colony. Here are the data for 13 colonies of sparrowhawks. If you look at the next slide, then it says plot the count of the new birds, which is going to be a response variable, against the percent of returning birds, which is our explanatory variable. So the first thing we need to do here is label each of our axes. So let's go ahead and do that on our graph. Down along the bottom here is going to be the percent of returning birds. Up the side is going to be the number of new birds. Okay, as we look here and we want to, again, fill up our chart as best we can, when we look at the percents, the percents go from a low of, it looks like, 45% to a high of, it's like 81%. So really, we're only going from, say, 45 up to 85 So when we go to pick our percents down here at the bottom, we want to spread that out as best we can. Well, plan ahead here. If we start at 40%, we can go then our first mark here at 
50, 55, 60, 65, 70, 75, 80, 85, and 90. Up the side, the number of new birds. Again, if we look back, the smallest number of birds is 5. The maximum number of new birds is 20. So we need a relatively shortened scale here, basically from 0 to 20. Since we have a bunch of boxes here, we can actually just count by ones. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, and 20. Now, when we go to do our scatter plot, you simply put a point at each of the corresponding values. So we begin. Five new adults, 74% return. So we go to five adults, 74% returning, and we are going to put a dot at that value. Next one, six adults, 66% returning. Eight adults, 81% returning. Eleven adults, 52% returning. 12 adults, 37 or 73% returning. And you can go through on your own and just complete this scatter plot. All right, so there's our scatter plot. Now, if we look at the following slide, it says describe the direction, form, and strength of the relationship between the number of sparrowhawks in the colony and the percent of returning adults. So again, we are looking only for a linear relationship. If I attempt to fit a line to this data, my line would probably go somewhere like that. And again, your calculator is going to do this for you. We're not going to get into linear regression right just yet. But again, that's approximately where our line would be. So we can see that there is somewhat of a linear relationship. We can draw a line that has most of these points relatively close to the line. We can see that the association, is it positive or is it negative? Well, it's negative. As the number of, or the percent of birds returning increases, the number of new birds is decreasing. So we know it's a negative association. We know that it's linear, linear and it's fairly strong. So we can say that there is a negative association. It is linear and it's fairly strong.
letter C, for short-lived birds, the association between these variables is positive. Changes in weather and food supply drive the populations of new and returning birds up or down together. For long-lived territorial birds, on the other hand, the association is negative because returning birds claim their territories in the colony and don't leave room for new recruits. Which type of species is the sparrow hawk? Well, since it was a negative relationship, that means the sparrow hawk must be a long lived territorial bird. <clears throat> Number eight, what is the relationship between returns from buying treasury bills and returns from buying common stocks. To buy a treasury bill is to make a short-term loan to the US government. This is much less risky than buying stock in a company, so on average, the returns on treasury bills are lower than the returns on stocks. Figure 3.5, which is on the next slide, plots the annual returns on stocks for the years 1950 to 2003 against the returns on treasury bills from the same years. Letter A. The best year for stocks during this period was 1954. The worst year was 1974. What were the returns for stocks in those two years? So we need to look for 1954 and 1974. 1954, we're told, was the best year. We're talking only about stocks here. So if we look at this scatter plot, percent of return of stocks is up the left side here. We want to know which one is the highest. That is this value right here. And the percent return for that value is around 50%. The worst year was 1974. What was the return in the worst year? Well, the worst year for stocks is right there. About what is that percent? Maybe negative 28%. Doesn't look like it's quite down 230. Letter B, treasury bills are a measure of the general level of interest rates. The years around 1980 saw very high interest rates. Treasury bill returns peaked in 1981. About what was the percent return that year? So in 1981, we're looking for the percent return of treasury bills, and we know that that was the best. So let's take a look. If we look at treasury bills, the percent of return increases as we go to the right. So the highest one is right here. And that is the return of about 15%. Letter C, some people say that high treasury bill returns tend to go with low returns on stocks. Does such a pattern appear clear in figure 3.5? Does the plot have any clear pattern? So this is asking, is there a negative association? High treasury bill returns go with low stock returns. Is there a negative association here? I would say not. Doesn't appear to be much of a pattern of anything. So no, does not appear to be a negative association and there is no clear pattern. Okay, problem 10, metabolic rate, the rate at which the body consumes energy is important in studies of weight gain, dieting, and exercise. The table below gives data on the lean body mass and resting metabolic rate for 12 women and seven men who are subjects in a study of dieting. Lean body mass given in kilograms is a person's weight leaving out all fat. Metabolic rate is, the measure, is measured in calories burned for 24 hours the same calories used to describe the energy content of food. The researchers believe that lean body mass is an important influence on metabolic rate. So we see we have a chart here of 19 people. 12 of them are women, seven of them are men. And what we're asked to do in the first 
problem here is make a scatter plot of the data for just the female subjects. What is the explanatory variable? So we're going to have to go to our calculator here. Okay, in your calculator, you want to go into Stat, Edit, and I've already entered them in. But down list one, you are going to want to put in the body mass for women only. List two will be the uh, metabolic rate for those same women. And obviously, you need to match them up as you go down. You should end up with 12 people in that column. Once you have those entered in, go into your stat plot. In your stat plot menu, go into the first plot here. You want to select scatter plot, which is the first graph right here. Hit enter. It'll ask you what list you want to choose from. Remember, you want your X list uh, to be your explanatory variable. In this case, the researchers believe that lean body mass is an important influence on metabolic rate. Okay, so that is your explanatory variable. So you want to pick list one as your explanatory variable, list two as your other variable. Hit zoom nine for zoom stat, and there is your scatter plot. From your scatter plot, okay, we can see a couple of things. Let's go back to our worksheet here first. Question, first question is, which is the explanatory variable? Just talked about that. The explanatory variable, since the researchers believe that lean body mass is an indicator of metabolic rate, that means that they're hoping that lean body mass will explain the metabolic rate. Letter B, is the association between these variables positive or negative? What is the form and what is the strength? Well, if we look at our calculator, we can see that this is clearly a positive association. As one is increasing, the other one is increasing. We can see that it's really a pretty strong linear relationship. I could draw a line through the middle of these values right in here, and all of these values would be pretty close to that line. So it's obviously a positive association. It is linear, and it is pretty strong. Part C, now add the data for the male subjects to your graph using a different color or different plotting symbol. Does the pattern of relationship that you observed in B hold for men also? How do male subjects as a group differ from female subjects as a group? Go back to the calculator. Go back into your stat menu and your edit. Okay, we want to leave list one and list two because we want the women to be compared. So now in list three, I am going to put the uh, body mass for men along with their metabolic rate paired up in list four. Once you have those entered in, you're going to go back into your stat plot menu. We're this time going to plot two and turn it on. Select your scatter plot. And now make sure you are selecting the correct list. I put the men's. Uh, lean body mass in list three, so my X list is going to be list three. I put their metabolic rate in list four, so I want that for list four. Hit zoom and nine again, actually, before I do that. One other thing I forgot to mention. We want to go down here then at the bottom two and pick a different symbol. Okay, the women were marked with this open circle here, so let's mark the men with this little addition sign so we know the difference between the two. Now hit zoom nine for zoom stat. And there are the seven males now added into our graph. Okay, question was, does the pattern that you observed in B hold for men also? Does this appear to be a positive association? Yes. Does it appear to be linear? Yes. Is it as strong? Eh, maybe not as strong. It looks like the men are a little bit more spread out than what the women are. Okay, so we can say that our relationship 
is the same, but not as strong. Okay, measuring linear correlation. So now we're going to get even a little bit more specific on how we're going to talk about the strength of a relationship. First of all, our eyes are not good judges of how strong a linear relationship is. Okay, if we look at these two graphs and you were asked which one has a stronger linear association. Some of you may say the first graph. Some of you may say the second graph, okay? Well, I can't tell just by looking at them, okay? But we do have a variable that we can measure that will tell us exactly how they are. So which scatter plot shows a stronger linear correlation? Actually, these are the same graphs. They're the same data points graphed and scatter plots. Using different scales. Okay, so these two actually have exactly the same strength. That is why you have to be careful and remember our rule is we want to fill up as much of the graph as we can. Okay, so in this case, the graph on the left would be a better graph to use than the one on the right because it uses the entire grid. Some things about correlation. Correlation measures the direction and strength of the linear relationship between two quantitative variables. Correlation is usually written as the variable R. So there's another variable now you need to know that R represents correlation. There is the formal definition and how we would calculate correlation. Again, you are not going to have to do any calculations. Your calculator will do the calculations for you. You need to know how to interpret R in the context of the problem. Okay, and one thing, big caution here when we talk about correlation. Correlation is not causation. So do not think that because two variables are correlated, that it means that one of the variable causes the other variable to happen. Some facts about correlation. Correlation makes no distinction between explanatory and response variables. So if when we do a scatter plot, again, if we know the explanatory variable and we know the response variable, put the explanatory variable on the x-axis, the response variable on the y-axis. If you don't know or aren't sure and you're worried, oh, it's not going to calculate correlation correctly, it doesn't make a difference. You're going to get the same correlation regardless of which variable you put on the axis. Because R uses the standardized value of the observations, R does not change when we change units. Okay, so it doesn't matter what we are measuring things in, whether we measure in inches, feet, centimeters, doesn't change the value of the correlation coefficient R. Positive R does indicate positive association. Negative R indicates negative association and that's very important so the sign on r is going to tell you whether it's a positive association or a negative association the correlation r is always a number between negative one and one values of r near zero indicate indicate a weak linear relationship the strength of the linear relationship increases as r moves away from zero towards either negative one or positive one as it gets closer to positive one the stronger the positive correlation is. As it gets closer to negative one, the stronger the negative correlation becomes. Values of R close to negative one and one indicate that the points in the scatter plot lie close to a straight line. 
the extreme values of negative 1 and 1 occur only in the case of a perfect linear relationship when the points lie exactly on the straight line. So our value of r, we have a continuum here from negative 1 to 1. If our value of r is here in the middle, there is no linear relationship if it's exactly 0. As it gets closer to 1, the more stronger the positive linear relationship is. And as it gets closer to negative 1, the stronger our negative linear relationship is. So remember, the sign is significant when you are talking about the correlation coefficient r. Some more facts about correlation here. Correlation requires that both variables be quantitative so that it makes sense to do the arithmetic indicated by the formula. So same thing with the scatter plot. Both things in a scatter plot need to be uh, quantitative. Same case when we uh, calculate correlation. Correlation does not describe curved relationships between variables, no matter how strong they are. So even if you've seen a relationship, boy, that's a perfect parabola. I know that that is a very, very strong relationship uh, related by that parabola. Correlation coefficient R only measures the strength of a linear relationship. Like the mean and standard deviation, the correlation is not resistant. R is strongly affected by a few outlying observations. So use R with caution when outliers appear in the scatter plot. In other words, one outlier in the scatter plot could make R's value a lot closer to 1 or a lot closer to negative 1 than it should be because of the influence of an outlier. Correlation should not be a complete summary. Okay, Even if the relationship between the variables is linear, you should always talk in terms of mean and standard deviation along with the correlation. And again, everything that we have talked about now, to be complete in analyzing a data set, you should be using everything that we have talked about to now don't use R alone and have that be the end-all, be-all to what you are doing when you are analyzing a data set. Okay, here are some examples of correlation. First one, correlation would be zero, meaning that there is no linear relationship. You can see you have a scatter plot there. There is no relationship between where the points are. Okay, the second one, points now get bunched up a little bit more towards a negative relationship. But again, not real strong, but notice it is negative. Okay, point three isn't even halfway to negative one, so it's not by any means a strong negative association, but there is some association there. Here we have a positive association getting a little bit stronger. Those points are all getting closer and closer to that line. And now notice that R is positive 0.5. And remember, positive 0.5, negative 0.5 have the same strength, but one is indicating the strength of a negative association, one the strength of a positive association. Fourth one, getting a little bit stronger now. All of those points are even a little bit closer to that line. It's a negative association again. Third one, correlation of 0.9. You can see these points even closer to the line. And finally, a negative correlation of negative 0.99. And all those points are very, very close to the given line. Problem 16, figure 3.4 is a scatter plot of the school grade point average versus IQ score for 78 8th grade or 7th grade students. Question A, is the correlation R for these data near negative 1? Clearly negative, but not near negative 1. Near 0, clearly positive, but not near 1, or near 1? And explain your answer. Well, in this case, we can see that there is definitely a positive association here. If I were to draw a line through this data, that would be close to our line of best fit. We can see that it is clearly going uphill, meaning as IQ score increases, their grade point average is also increasing. So we can see that it is clearly positive, 
is that going to be close to one? No, especially down here at smaller values. They're way away from the line. They get a little bit closer to the line as IQ score and GPA increases. But for these people that have a low IQ, some had a high GPA, some had a low GPA. So in that area, it is not very strong. So we would say that this relationship is uh, clearly positive, but not near one. Letter B, refer to figure 3.8. That's the one we just looked at from the previous exercise. Is the correlation here closer to one than that of 3.4 or closer to zero? So which one has a stronger association, do you think, here as we look at this? Okay, so is the correlation you think here, is the relationship stronger here or in the previous one? I think pretty clearly it is here. All those points are very, very close to the line. So we would say that the core, uh, figure 3.4 has an R value closer to one. I'm sorry, that's, this is 3.8. I'm going to retract what I said there. All right, this is figure 3.8 here. The previous one was 3.4, but what I didn't see and I do now is this outlier value down here. Okay, so actually when I drew in this line of best fit, this outlier is going to pull that in. So we're probably going to have a line of best fit that is more in this range here. Okay, so now the strength of that linear relationship is not very strong. So the previous one which was 3.4, is going to have an R value closer to 1. And the outlier in 3.8 will affect the value of R. If that value wasn't there, I think this would probably have a higher R value. And again, this is why we're gonna actually be calculating R values because our eyes, again, are not good measures of strength of correlation. Use your calculator to find the correlation between the percent of returning birds and the number of new birds from the data in exercise 3.6. So we're going to go to our calculator now, and we're going to put this information into our calculator. So if we go to our calculator here, again, I already have this data entered in. So go ahead and enter in your two lists, one with percent returning, one with number of new birds. And we're going to go into, once you have that entered in, go into your stat and calculate. Okay, we want to calculate a linear regression. We want to do it in the form that we talked about. There's two forms on here. It technically doesn't matter which one you use. Get used to using number eight here, which is A plus BX. We want a linear regression relating list one and list two. Hit enter, and right now I do not have diagnostics on on this calculator. If you get this same thing here, this is what you are supposed to get, okay? But you don't have your diagnostics on. The way you turn these on is go into your catalog. So hit second function and zero for catalog. Hit D for diagnostics. And now arrow down to diagnostics on. too 
far. Hit enter on diagnostics on. Hit enter again, and now those should be on unless you change batteries in your calculator and it, or you reset something. So now if I go back into my stat menu and calculate, again, I want linear regression A plus BX, which is number 8 on list 1 and list 2. Now we get our R square value, which we will talk about later, and more importantly right now, our R value. Our R value is negative 0.748. So what does that indicate? Well, remember if we look back at previous slides, when we did our scatter plot on this data, okay, we saw and we knew that this was a moderately strong negative association. And that R value indicates the same thing. Make a scatter plot of the data with two new points added. Point A, a 10% return for 25 new birds. Point B, a 40% return for five new birds. Find the two new correlations for the original data plus point A and for the original data plus point B. So let's, we need to do two things. We need to do our data with point A included, and we need to do our data with point B included. Okay, point A, 10% return, 25 new birds. So let's go ahead and put that into our calculator. <clears throat> Edit, list one. We want a 10% return. And 25 new birds. And now we want to calculate the same thing we just did before. So linear regression on list one and list two. Now our R value is negative 0.807. So that made our negative association a little bit stronger. Now for our next correlation, we want to do the original data plus point B. So I want to exchange these two points out. So go stat, edit. I don't want 10%. Now I want uh, 40% with five new birds. Get out of there. Pull up the same entry again, hit enter, and now you see our correlation is negative 0.469. So you can see by adding outliers, sometimes the outlier can make our R value indicate more strength in our relationship, or sometimes our outlier can indicate less strength in our relationship. So that's why R is not resistant, meaning that you always need to pay attention to outliers. Okay, last one here, number 20. The gas mileage of an automobile first increases and then decreases as the speed increases. Suppose that this relationship is very regular as shown in the following data on speed. Make a scatter plot of mileage versus speed on your calculator. So let's go ahead and do that. Go to the calculator. Stat. Edit. Let's clear out these lists. And we are going to put this in. So 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60. Twenty-four, twenty-eight, thirty, twenty-eight, twenty-four. 30, 28, 24. Now we want to do a scatter plot of this. So we need to turn the second plot off. We're only going to use the first one this time. 
list one versus list two, zoom nine for zoom stat, there's our scatter plot. Well, this scatter plot, we see a pretty clear relationship. This is very clearly a parabola opening upside down. So we have a uh, quadratic relationship. Question B says, show that the correlation between speed and mileage is R equals zero. Explain why the correlation is zero, even though there is a strong relationship between speed and mileage. Well, let's check this. Let's go with stat, calculate. Let's calculate that linear regression on list one and list two. Hit enter. So we get an R value of zero. But when we look at our graph, we saw clearly that there is a strong relationship. Y is R zero here. Remember what R measures. R measures the strength of a linear relationship only. So in this case, our value of R for the linear correlation is zero because the stat is not related by a linear relationship. Again, as you look through the summary here, make sure that you know the vocabulary. If there are major concepts that when you're reading through this, you're not sure of, those are things you need to study more or get in and get extra help on. That is it for section 3.1.